22. We're going to pick up in verse 54 here in just a couple moments. Let me give you just a, a brief review. You remember what's going on. It's early on the day of the crucifixion, pre-dawn. We're in the wee hours of the morning, 1, 2 o'clock probably, very, very early. Judas has led the temple guards to the Garden of Gethsemane, then identified Jesus with a kiss. Remember, the kiss would be the equivalent of, of uh, a handshake in that day, a sign of friendship. Uh, he, he betrays Jesus with a sign of friendship. Remember, the disciples, they've been sleeping, and they were tired. The Bible says they were sleeping for sorrow, meaning they had sort of cried themselves to sleep, and so they're they're waking up, and remember, they had, when they had fallen asleep, there were 12 people in the garden. When they woke up, there were probably close to 200, <laughs> roughly. It's a, it's a big change. They had gone to sleep, and it was dark. They wake up, and there are soldiers, the rattling of weapons. There are torches. There's the, the shadows that fire cast in, in woods. And so, so it was kind of a, a rude awakening to them. But you remember, Peter wakes up, and, and he kind of comes to himself and the disciples gather around Jesus and they say, Lord, should we strike with the sword? And, Jesus, or, or, and Peter doesn't wait for an answer. Peter's always a man of action. Uh, he's seldom, uh, never, seldom right, but never uncertain, right? So he, he grabs his sword and he runs in and he's ready to take on the whole bunch of them. And he takes a swipe. And again, I don't think it's because he was a master swordsman. He missed. He took off Malchus's right ear. You know how that bleeds, right? If you've ever gotten a nick on your ear and it bleeds bad, when your ear's laying on the ground and you're just holding where it was, it was a bloody scene. But Jesus stops the tension. Imagine as Peter makes that swipe, Malchus cries and falls to the ground and there's blood beginning to pour. Think of what the other soldiers did. They all grab their weapon. They're if this is how it's going to be, they're ready to go. The Romans, they're used to this. They're used to this. So Jesus stops all of that. He reaches down and he touches the side of Malchus's head and heals his, heals his, his issue, his, his ear. So all of the tension of that is, is done away. Jesus stands there. He rebukes the religious leaders in verses 52 and 53. He tells them, you knew I was in the temple all week, but you didn't come then. And, and he's, he's pointing out the fact that they're scared of the people. They wanted to maintain public opinion. He'd been in the, te in the temple teaching every day, but they hadn't tried to arrest him because of their fear of the people and being unpopular. So now, under cover of darkness, the enemies of Jesus make their move. It's at this point, we read in Matthew 26, 56, that the disciples of Christ saw their opportunity to escape. Jesus is being led away, bound to the temple. He's being led away, and, and the disciples see this as their opportunity, and they flee. They melt into the shadows. So now it's Jesus being led alone up to Caiaphas' house. This is the first of many destinations he will come to on this day. Verse 54 is where we'll pick up. Then took they him and led him and brought him unto the, into the high priest's house, and Peter followed afar off. Okay, so Peter did run. He did leave Jesus in the garden. We don't know. Maybe he hid within the garden. Maybe he jumped the wall and, and hid in some bushes. But he didn't go too far because as Jesus leaves, and remember, it's not that far from the Garden of Gethsemane to, to Jerusalem. It's just a, a, a few hundred yards so Peter's watching as the, the procession with all of the soldiers and all of the torches makes its way up, and he can see Jesus there. And so he's following, being careful to maintain cover behind bushes and trees and in the shadows. He doesn't want to he doesn't want to be seen. We're unsure of the exact location of Caiaphas' house. In John 18, it's called a palace, but it's likely that it was in close proximity to the temple. Again, we don't know exactly because there's not, a, there's not an archaeological site that says Caiaphas' house. So they just have to look. But if you see here, you see the, the Garden of Gethsemane, likely Jesus taken up and he comes in and they bring him down to the palace of the high priest. Again, we don't know exactly where it was, but very likely in the general neighborhood, the vicinity of the temple. 
Many scholars believe that when it speaks of the high priest's house, that it's actually, think more of a compound. So in that day, most houses, especially those of wealthy people, would have had kind of a wall around it. Now, it's not, not a prison wall, but, you know, a wall that would keep out uh, stray animals and would keep out people who were trying to do harm. And many believe that in this compound were the homes of both Annas and Caiaphas. Now, just, just to, to remind you, Annas had been the high priest. Okay? He had had to leave for some political reasons. Okay? But he, he had been the high priest, and so he is still called the high priest. Much like we still refer to former presidents as President so-and-so, he is Annas, the high priest. But his son-in-law, Caiaphas, who, whose house this is, he is the sitting high priest. He's the current high priest. So you have two men who've held the office. One currently holds the office. Some have surmised that they took Jesus to his house rather than to the temple because they're trying to maintain secrecy just a little bit longer. And that would make sense because they had taken him under cover of darkness. They kind of bring him into the city. Now, how, how inconspicuous would a whole troop with torches and swords be as they come? I, I don't know. <laughs> Probably not that inconspicuous. It's hard to hide 200 people. But as they come in, they take Jesus and, and they put him back into Caiaphas' house. And they're going, to, they're going to begin one of his many trials that he will have this evening. But again, of particular note, our focus is not going to be so much on what's going on with Jesus as what's going on with Peter because he's following so he's, he's just a few yards behind, a few hundred yards behind maybe as they come up. And then as they get into the city, he's got more cover. So imagine Peter. What is he by trade? He's a fisherman. <laughs> and so you see Peter, he's peeking around corners, make sure, okay, it's clear. He runs to the next spot, runs to the next spot. And he's, he's following because, because he loved Jesus. Would you give me that? He loved Jesus. And that's why he's following. He wants to see this is the man who he knows to be the Messiah. And so he's following. I'm not going to get involved. I just want to see what happens. I just want to be able to, to watch what Jesus does. He comes back. He's not identified. Perhaps he's feeling bad about deserting Christ in the garden. We don't know his reasoning. But John 18, verse 15, we're going we're gonna to look at the parallel passages a lot because they give us a lot more information. John 18, 15 tells us, And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Now, who do you think that is? Well, in John's gospel, whenever he talks about another disciple, or the disciple whom Jesus loved, he's usually referring to himself. So, we, we, we know this to be John. And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. That disciple was known unto the high priest, and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. So Peter isn't the only disciple who's following. He's one of two. Peter and John are following. He's making his way up. John, he, again, he doesn't typically identify, identify himself by, the name, by his name. But he's following. This verse tells us that John was known to the high priest. And it doesn't give us any more information. We don't know how John was known to the high priest. Maybe their families had, had known each other growing up. It's interesting because John is from Galilee and the high priests are from Judea. So they're from different parts of the country. But John is known to the high priest. We don't know any more of the relationship. But given the fact that John will be the only disciple who will be at the foot of the cross, it would be safe to, to assume that his status as a disciple of Jesus Christ was public knowledge. John, the, the, the apostle John, he's not hiding. He goes in, when he goes into the home of the high priest, he goes in and they say, why are you here? I'm, I'm following Jesus. And they would have known. So John is following Jesus into this, into this high priest's home. John 18, verse 16, the very next verse says, But Peter stood at the door without. So John gets in, because John knows people. Peter, he's stuck outside. Maybe he waited too long and got too far behind. He's stuck outside. Then went that, out that other disciple, which was known unto the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door and brought in Peter. 
I love the relationship between Peter and John in the Gospel of John. It's, there's kind of a rivalry there uh, that, that's ongoing. But Peter's stuck outside. John's inside. John looks, and he sees Peter outside the gate. He's looking through the holes in the gate. And so he goes to the person who keeps the, who keeps the gate, and he says to this, it's a, it's a young woman, it's a, it's a maiden. He goes to this young woman who keeps the gate, and he says, hey, I know this guy. This is, this is Peter. Let's let him in. So she opens the door because John asked to let Peter in. Okay, That's important to remember. John said, he's with me. Let him in. So Peter comes in, and he makes his way into the courtyard. Okay, lots of people, lots of activity. It's a big night. The, think about the, the, the atmosphere in the high priest home. They're happy. They think they're winning. They just got Jesus. They finally got him where they want him, they believe. But we come then to Peter's first denial of Christ in verse 55. And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall and were set down together, Peter sat down among them. Peter's trying to blend in. He's been trying to blend in all night. <laughs> and here he is. He's, he's once again, he, he finds a place in there with a bunch of other people. Peter, uh, in this day and age, it wouldn't have been easy. If you describe somebody as the guy with the beard and the robe, okay, everybody has a beard and a robe. So Peter kind of blends into the scene. Okay? So he's sitting there in the firelight. If you've ever tried to identify somebody by firelight, it's a little bit more difficult because you've got shadows and such. So Peter sits down, he's doing good. It's interesting that he's sitting down with the people who just arrested Jesus. He's sitting with the servants of the high priest. Whose ear had Peter chopped off just a little bit earlier? One of the high priest's servants, his name was Malchus. So this is strange company for Peter to be keeping. He's sitting amongst the people who he'd just been willing to go single-handedly into combat against. And he's trying to blend in. In the dark and the shadows made by the fire, Peter believes that he is unknown. But look at verse 56. And put this together with what we know of how Peter got in. But a certain maid beheld him as he sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him and said... This man also was with him. So she comes, she points at Peter as he's sitting there trying to blend in. And she says, this guy, he's one of them. He follows Jesus. Now, this wasn't just any man. If you remember what I said about John asking that Peter be let in, we read in John 18, 17, then said the damsel that kept the door unto Peter. <laughs> okay. Art thou not also one of this man's disciples? He said, I'm not. So she knows that Peter is one of them because John had already said, let's let him in because he's with me and I'm with Jesus. So she's, she's just speaking truth, but Peter's called. Can you imagine when you're trying to be inconspicuous and suddenly you're called? Imagine what Peter did. His palms get sweaty all of a sudden. He starts breathing faster. His stomach does that thing that your stomach does when you get caught. And Peter's sitting there, and his, his, his knee-jerk reaction is, nope, nope, I'm not, I'm not with him. I'm not with that guy. Verse 57 here in our text. And he denied him, saying, woman, I know him not. The word deny, it's a Greek word. It means to disavow. To refuse to acknowledge. Matthew 26, 27 tells us that he said, But he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. I don't know this Jesus. I don't even know what you're talking about. Peter's trying to, trying to make his case. Do you remember what Peter had said? If you look back at verse 33 of this chapter, they were in the upper room. Listen to what Peter said when Jesus told him what was coming. Here's, here's Peter's word. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both unto prison and to death. Lord, I'll die for you. But here, faced with the question of a little girl, this rough and tough fisherman who'd only a short time before been ready to take on a whole garrison single-handedly, 
folds. One commentator says, it took only a menial maid to fell the chief of the twelve. Gone were all his high and heroic protestations to Jesus. Gone all of the spurious courage from his heart and from the hand that had snatched out the sword in Gethsemane. Here stands the errant coward who is unable to confess his heavenly Lord and cringes in lying denial. Peter's caught. He's nervous. He's scared. Peter's sweating because of this young girl who came up and said, you're with Jesus. Woman, I'm not only not with him, I don't even know what you're talking about, is his reply. Mark 14, 68. But he denied, saying, I know not, neither understand I what thou sayest. And he went out into the porch, and the cock crew. Peter withdraws from the fire. Too, too many eyes here. I need to blend in better. I need more shadows. I need to get away from the light. Anything significant about that? Okay. He says, I'm going to withdraw. So he goes out into the porch, which would be the area between the courtyard and the home, usually a covered area, and he goes out into this porch. More darkness where he can, he can escape. As he's going out there, the cock crows. The rooster chimes in. Now, in the upper room, in Mark 14, 30, Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, This day, even in this night, before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. Yeah. There's one. The cock has crowed one time, and Peter has denied Christ one time. Now, this should have been a reminder, shouldn't it? Peter should have said, Oh, oh my goodness. Did I just do that? This should have been a speed bump. As Peter's going down this road, it should have been a, oh, oh my goodness. But it's not. It's not because we go right into his next denial. Verse 58. <clears throat> and after a little while, another saw him. Now, in the Greek, the word another is feminine. It's a, a feminine pronoun. You'll see why in a moment. While he was, and after a little while, another saw him and said, Thou art also of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. Peter is still in enemy territory. He might have more shadows where he's standing right now, but he's still surrounded by, by the enemy. When verse, tells, when verse 58 tells us that another saw him, we turn to Matthew for more detail. Matthew 26, 71 says, And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him. Again, Peter is not failing to a Roman centurion. He's failing to a young lady who comes up to him. And said unto them that were, with, that, that were there, This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied with an oath. I do not know the man. He's getting more emphatic every time. Another maid. This maid doesn't ask Peter. She makes a public announcement. She says, hey, this is one of them. This is one of Jesus' disciples. Peter's very quick to deny. This time with an oath. The oath would be when the same idea as when you go into court. And they swear you in and you are under oath. Peter is essentially saying, I swear to you, I don't know this man. He's, he's trying to, to bring more, more evidence, more, more strength behind it, more feeling behind it. I don't know who this is. Far from the bold stand he thought he'd take, Peter is flustered. He's embarrassed by being asked by servant girls about his relationship with Jesus. Why can't these girls just go away? Why can't they leave me alone? I'm here because I want to see. I just want to see what happens with Jesus. I don't want to be associated with him. I just want to see. And these people keep pointing me out. Peter's third denial is found in verse 59. And about the space of one hour after, another confidently affirmed, saying, Of a truth, this man also was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter is trapped in a waking nightmare. He's scared 
And he's responding in fear. It's been an hour since that maid had said, this is one of them. And he finally found a place where he thought he was safe. An hour passes. How long of an hour do you think that was for Peter? Oh, it must have seemed like eternity. As he's hiding, he's, he's trying to hear what he can from inside of what's going on with Jesus. He's trying to see Jesus, and, and we know from a little bit later in the passage, he does actually have a line of sight. So he's able to see Jesus, but he's, he's waiting. It's been an hour. Maybe his pulse had started to go down. His breathing had started to regulate when all of a sudden here comes a man. And he says, this one was with Jesus. This time, this man, it's not just any man. If you look at John 18, 26, it says, One of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Did not I see thee in the garden with him? Uh-oh. <laughs> of all the things that Peter has done in the last, oh, 24 hours, his chopping off the ear of Malchus was not his smartest. And here comes one of Malchus's kinsmen, one of, one of Malchus's family says, I know who you are. I saw you in the garden. You kind of grabbed the spotlight there for a little bit, bud, when you took off the ear of my cousin or whatever the relationship was. Peter's not going to be able to talk his way out of this one as easy because there's more detail. Now, have you ever noticed what happens with the news? You hear the news and there's this, this happened. Okay? This terrible thing happened. And there's more information. It, actually, but let's say there was, a, there was a terrible car accident. And then you hear it later that everyone lived. A lot of times the fact that everyone lived doesn't make the same splash as the initial headline. Have, you know what I'm talking about? Look, the fact is, is when everybody got back to the base there, the, the high priest's house, everybody's talking about, hey, did you hear about Malchus? <laughs> Did you hear about it? Look over there. See, he's got that blood all over his all over his robe. That happened because some nut took his ear off with a sword. You won't believe what happened. And everybody's talking about it. But the people who hadn't seen that Malchus still has an ear, what do you figure they thought? They hear Malchus got his ear cut off. I'll bet news that it got put back on didn't spread quite as fast. So here, the buzz in the in the place is, hey. Malchus, who everybody knows because he's one of the servants, he got his ear taken off by some guy. And here comes one of Malchus's kin, his family, and says, there's the guy who took Malchus's ear off. Oh, my goodness. Can you imagine what Peter's going through right now? Yeah, Matt, put yourself there. He thought he was hiding in the shadows. He thought he'd gotten away with it. And now everybody knows. And everybody's looking at him. And everybody's saying, what? They took his ear off? What? It's going on, and it's, it's a nightmare, a waking nightmare for him. Mark 14, verse 70 says, and, after a little, and a little after, they that stood by said again to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thou art a Galilean, and thy speech agreeeth thereto. This man's a Galilean. You sound like a Galilean. The, the different areas of the, of the country of Israel had different accents, much similar to how we have. When somebody from Maine comes to you and they're talking about where they should park the car, okay? And you say, you're not from around here, are you? Oh yeah, I'm from around here. No, you're not, because we don't say park car around here, so we say park your car, okay? It's a little bit different. And here Peter, who sounds like a Galilean, he's talking. And every word he says, every word that he uses to deny Christ makes the case for the opposition. Every time he opens his mouth, people say, this is a Galilean. He's with Jesus. This is actually the Galilean who cut off Malchus's ear. There's a mountain of evidence that's piling up against Peter. And Peter knows that he's going to need to be a little more brazen this time. He's going to have to make his case. He's got to make this crowd of people believe, I do not know this Jesus. He's going to have to make his case. Verse 60, and Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately while he gets faith, the cock crew. 
Again, another gospel gives us some more important detail. Matthew 26, 74 says, Then he began to curse and swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cop trimmed. Mark 14, 71 tells us the same. In order to allay suspicion, Peter has to overstate his case. He has to back up his denial. When it says that he began to curse, that's not that he began to use words that were inappropriate. It's that he began to imprecate or to call down curses. Think of it as, God strike me dead if I'm lying. I don't know this man, is what he's saying. He's cursing. He's calling down a curse upon himself. Smart? No. no. But he's scared. He's worried. He's, he's in a waking nightmare. It says that he began to curse and to swear. Again, to like to put himself under an oath. I swear I don't know who this is. And God be my judge. May I be struck down if I'm lying. I don't know that. Verse 60 again, the last part. And immediately while he yet spake, the cock crew. So he's still talking. He's still making his case. I don't know this guy. Again, he's talking with his Galilean accent. Everybody knows this is a Galilean. The reason he's here, the maid who let him in, she knows. But he's making his case. I don't know this man. But he's, as he's speaking, he's drowned out for a moment by a rooster. Mark 14, 30. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee this day, this is what Jesus said in the upper room, Verily th this day, even this night before the cock crowed twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter was in the midst of saying his denial, and the cock crowed again. And Peter comes to a crushing realization in this moment. Verse 61. Verse 61. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him before the cock crow, Thou shalt deny me thrice. This is amazing. Peter had been careful to maintain a line of sight to Jesus. He, he, that's why he was there, after all. I want to be able to see what happens. It doesn't say that Jesus turned and scanned the crowd looking for Peter. It says Jesus turned and looked at Peter. Jesus knew exactly where Peter was standing. And he turns from what's going on in, the, in Jesus' trial. It, we'll see a little bit later. Jesus had been beaten already. Okay, A lot is going on. And Jesus turns and he looks Peter dead in the eyes. And Peter comes to a realization. He remembers what Jesus had said. He remembers the prophecy that he would deny his Lord. Not only did Jesus know exactly where Peter was standing, he also knew everything that Peter had said. He had heard the first denial, the second denial, the third denial. But it wasn't until Peter looked into the eyes of Jesus, the one who he had just publicly and forcibly denied, that it clicks. And he realizes. His heart breaks when he hears the words of Jesus echo through his mind. Imagine with me as he hears Jesus say, Before the cock crows twice, you'll deny me three times. Peter had been proud. He'd been self-confident. He'd been arrogant. And now the same man who'd been prepared to take on the whole, gar uh, the whole garrison in the garden breaks down. Verse 62 tells us, And Peter went out and wept bitterly. The same Peter, remember, he's still in a crowd. He's still surrounded by the same people who had just heard him swearing and taking oaths that he didn't know who Jesus was, and all of a sudden he breaks. And Peter, suddenly he doesn't care what people think anymore. He begins to shoulder his way out. He's going for the gate, and he goes out, out of the light of the, the trial of Christ. He goes out into the darkness and the shadows of the city, and he weeps bitterly. They say it's always darkest just before dawn. And the darkest hours of this night find Peter weeping and sobbing in the shadows because he denied his Lord. 
Now the question that we need to ask from this passage, because this is a well-known story from, from Scripture, what led to Peter's fall? Peter's downward spiral has been really fast. It's been less than 12 hours from him declaring, Lord, I die with you. I'll go to jail with you. I die with you. Lord, I'm here for the long haul. It's been less than 12 hours from him saying that to him swearing an oath before many that he doesn't even know who this man is. What can we learn from Peter's downfall to avoid taking those same steps? Because that's what a wise person would do. A wise person would read this and I hope as you've been as you've been following along I hope you put yourself in Peter's place and you realize how easy that was, how natural that was for him to do what he did. The first step in Peter's downfall was his pride. Proverbs 16, 18 tells us, Pride goeth before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. We've shortened that to a, a proverb that gets thrown around, pride goes before a fall, right? It does. In the upper room, Peter had declared his undying loyalty. To prison, to death. Lord, I'll go with you to the bitter end. Matthew 26, 33 says, Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Peter had placed himself on a pedestal even above the other disciples. He said, Lord, I don't know what these guys are going to do, but I'm with you. It'll be you and me at the end, Lord. We'll both, we'll go, we'll die together if that's what it takes, but I'm right here. You hear the pride? Jesus did. His pride set him up. The, the higher you go, the further you have to fall. The higher you place yourself on a pedestal, the further to the bottom it is. And Peter has placed himself on quite the pedestal. He had also rejected Jesus' reproof. Jesus had told Peter, before dawn, you're going to deny me three times. Think for a moment. The religious leaders weren't necessarily looking for the disciples to arrest them. But Peter may have been of some special interest because of his behavior in the garden. They're not looking for Bartholomew. They're not looking for Simon the Zealot. They're not looking for, for the other disciples. But why might the chief priests be looking for Peter? Well, because of the whole issue with Malchus's ear. Again, a commentator said, Some think that Peter was scared without real cause that he misjudged the situation and could have confessed without real danger to himself. After all, John had done that. John was a, had publicly followed Christ. But whether there was a cause or not, fright operates in either case. Peter was surely in danger. We may take it that he would have been arrested forthwith, taken before Annas and held at least for a time. And if his slashing of Malchus' ear should have, come be should have become known, serious punishment may have been the result. Peter had some cause to say, I don't want to be identified in this setting because they might take me. They might arrest me. I don't think he would have been put to death, but he's not looking for any of the attention. And he knows that they're angry with Jesus. Proverbs 29, 25 tells us, the fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be saved. Peter's scared. Peter was in the garden. He'd woken up to the man who he knows to be the Messiah being taken away, bound by his enemies. He's been called out three times. He's, he's scared, and probably rightfully so. But fear does not lead us towards godliness. The fear of man doesn't lead you to be more godly. Another thing that led to Peter's fall is he didn't pray. Look back at verse 40 and look what Jesus says. Jesus told his disciples in the garden, he said, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. Peter didn't pray. What did he actually do? He slept. Again, I don't think he was being belligerent or rebellious. He was exhausted. He was brokenhearted. But he didn't pray. Jesus said, Pray because temptation's coming. 
Jesus knows what's ahead. Rather than praying, Peter had given in to the desire of his flesh for sleep. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Peter thought, I've got this. I can do this. I'll go with Jesus to the grave. He folded when a girl, a little, a little damsel, Peter's a rough and tough man, he takes off, he takes off ears with swords, and he folded when a little girl came up to him and said, weren't you with Jesus? I don't even know the guy. He folded fast because of his pride, because of his fear, because of his unwillingness to pray. He folded. And he ends up going out into the night, crying bitterly. Again, when we read this, don't mistake this weeping bitterly for a single tear rolling down Peter's face. He is a broken man. He just blew it. And Jesus looked at it. And it crushed him. But 2 Corinthians 7.10 tells us, Godly sorrow worketh repentance weeks ago, we looked at verse 31. Look back at it for a moment. This is Jesus talking to Peter. Same upper room where he foretold Peter's denial. Verse 31, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I pray for you, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Peter had to be broken before he could be used. Peter's pride would have prevented God from being able to use him. God can use a broken vessel. In fact, God regularly uses broken vessels, broken people, but he doesn't use dirty ones. And Peter was dirty. He came with pride. He came with arrogance. He came with self-will and independence. He says, God, I've got this. It'll be just you and me at the end. And now he's been broken. He's a broken man as he goes out. He'd been broken of his self-sufficiency, his pride, his arrogance, his independence. And that had to happen before he would be able to strengthen the other disciples, as we read there in verse 32. Peter had to realize just how weak he was before God would use him to thunder forth his truth on the day of Pentecost. In less than 60 days, Peter is going to stand up. The same Peter who, who just caved to a little girl who came up and said, You were with Jesus, right? I don't even know who he is. In less than 60 days on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, Peter's going to stand up and he's going to say, You crucified the Holy One and the just. You're murderers of the Son of God. What happened? It started here. The breaking where Peter broke before God. He realized, I, I can't do this. I'm not sufficient. I folded. Peter had the mistaken notion that many of us carry around. And, and I want to I wanna speak to you here for just a second. Hear me out. There are many of us today who would say, I die for Jesus. I die for my faith. And I hope that's true. We may have opportunity to. I hope not. But, but persecution could very easily come to us. We could be given the opportunity to suffer for our faith in that way. We would say, I die for Jesus. But I want you to see that Peter was ready to do the big showy things. But he wasn't willing to speak up for Christ when it counted. He was willing to take on a garrison of Roman soldiers and temple guards with one sword. But he wasn't willing to speak up when a little girl came up to him and said, Are you with Jesus? Here's, here's the point I want you to take. Dying for Christ is monumental. Psalm 116.15 tells us that precious in the Lord is the death of his saints. The blood of the martyrs does not fall unnoticed in heaven. God knows what's going on. To die for Christ is a high calling indeed. 
But God hasn't called any of us to this point in our lives to die for his sake. Let me tell you what he asks. It's in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. And he said unto them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. Peter just denied Christ because he was trying to do what needed to be done in the power of his flesh. He was willing to do the big showy things when what Jesus really wants from him and from you and me is to deny self. Take up our cross daily, meaning dying to self. To say, Lord, my wants, my ambitions, my desires, they're all yours. I give them to you. I'll do whatever you want. To die for Christ takes a moment in time. To live for Christ takes moment by moment by moment by moment. The, the martyrs who've gone to the state where they've been burned alive for their faith, they did that. And it's, it's truly a, a testimony to what the, the power of God can do. But the same power of God that helps them to die for Christ will help you and me to live for Christ. That's what God is looking for. He's looking for people who won't deny him, but will deny self. Who will take up their cross daily and follow him. Peter said he was willing to take up the cross. But this evening, this evening that we just read about, proved that he wasn't even willing to deny himself. He's not, he's not ready to take up the cross. You won't take up your cross daily until you've denied yourself. The, the order of this verse is significant. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, his wants, his desires, his aspirations, his plan, his schedule. Let him deny himself, take up his cross daily. Meaning I die to self and I, I wake up every day and not just every day, but every moment of every day. Lord, what I want doesn't matter. I'll do your will. Echoing the prayer of God there in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but thine be done. The message is simple here this morning by application. Here it is. You and I have opportunities on a regular basis to deny Christ. Our culture provides lots of them. When we could say, I'm going to do what I want to do in spite of what I'm told in God's word to do. We have lots of opportunities to deny Christ. God is looking for us to deny self. But we need to learn the lessons from Peter. Peter was proud. If you are proud, you say, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not the best Christian, but I'm pretty good. Oh, no. You're a mess. And, and so am I if I get into that, into that set. If I say, you know, I, I don't have this whole Christian thing figured out, but I'm a whole lot better than so-and-so. Pride goes before destruction every single time. And the higher you place yourself on a pedestal, the further it is to the ground. So allow Christ to, to put you where he wants you. Peter exalted himself. Peter depended on the strong arm of his flesh. I can do this. And he couldn't. And he realized it in a public setting. Humble yourself. Place yourself at his disposal. Depend on his strength, not on your own. In essence, deny yourself. Take up your cross daily and follow him. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Maybe you're here this morning. And God has spoken to you about the fact, perhaps, that you've allowed pride in. Now, you wouldn't be so bold as to make one of the foolish statements that I said earlier. Where you, where you out loud compare yourself to others, but maybe in your heart you've convinced yourself that you're beyond those sins. You're beyond what others could do. I would encourage you. The Bible says that if we humble ourselves, that he will exalt us. But that God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. So humble yourself today before him and say, Lord, I can't, but you can, and I'm asking you to. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Today's the day. You should do it. Jesus came. We're reading about the lead up to his crucifixion. He died on the cross for your sins. To bear sin's wages.
to make a way that you could be reconciled in the sight of God so that you can have peace with him now and for all eternity live in his presence. If you've never trusted Christ, I'd love to talk with you after the service. I'd love to show you from God's word how you can know for certain that if you were to die today or 10 years from today, that you'd go to be with the Lord. I'd love to show you from his word how you can have that. Believer, humble yourself. If you're here without Christ, today's the day to come to him. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. Lord, as we think of Peter, Lord, we think of him as, as a man who you used greatly. And we often forget that before you used him, he had to be broken. Lord, I pray that, that we, as, as believers, would humble ourselves and come to you denying ourselves and seeking to follow you every day in whatever it is that you would have us to do. Lord, if there's one here this morning who's never trusted you as personal Savior, I pray that today would be the day. In Jesus' name, amen.